Today on Real Life, Remembering Pearl Harbor. Martin Bennett shares the remarkable story of how a Japanese pilot who led the attack found Jesus. In Hard Questions, the pastors give us practical answers for life's most difficult topics. And on Real Life Coaching, Sarah Bowling teaches us how to sidestep the spiritual landmines. That's today on Real Life. This is real life. God loves you. Jesus died for you. The Holy Spirit, he empowers you. Mm-hmm. And the Bible is your and my guide to abundant, abundant life. life. Abundant life. Abundant life. Not Amen. Settle forward life. No way. It is abundant. It's beyond your comprehension. Not chicken little life. It is not. <laughs> it is victorious. Not bread and water life. Bread and water. Hey, <laughs> I, it's going to be, well, I no, guess what's best of that? Okay. <laughs> I, I'm Don Black. I'm, yes. I'm mm-hmm. your host, and I'm here with my beautiful co-host Terry, along with, <laughs> let the drum roll, please, Pastor J. Anthony Amen. Gilbert. Yes. Yes. Chicken Little. <laughs> chicken Little, brother. You, you've ever had a chicken? Ever seen anybody with a chicken little life? No. They got no. nothing. <laughs> they living on a little bit mm-hmm. and just kind of limping along. I always know. heard the chicken little. That was the guy that always said the sky is falling, right? That's right. Yeah, the right. sky is falling. The sky is but falling. But I guess that would be apropos for someone kind that has of, that type of life. Mm-hmm. Kind of fits the case, yeah, you know. Is, right. The sky is falling. Well, we're so glad you joined mm-hmm. us. Welcome to our program. This program is really just pretty simple. We've dedicated it and asked the Holy Spirit to produce it in His way. Mm-hmm. Let it be his program. We want God's anointing to flow through this program, Terry. We, yes, we don't right. want it to be a man-made or woman-made program. Mm-hmm. We want the Holy Spirit, his presence to be welcome here. Amen. His Amen. anointing to be uh, coveted. We, we covet his presence. Mm-hmm. We just want him to show, show himself here in, a, in, a, in, a, in his love and his power. And we welcome you. And so because we're connected by the television, mm. we have this, uh, there's no distance in God, Pastor. He's, he's everywhere all the time. And so we can be in unity even though we're not in the same physical location if our minds are in unity. Mm. That's right. Well, you know, that's how you can be blessed from messages back in the 1500s or 1700s. Because as long as you're in agreement with what's being said, that anointing is still here and still present. That anointing today is available for you in your homes. And that's what I love about real life. It's a platform for the Holy Spirit right, to do what he does best. That's you right. know, y'all keep saying present. Do you hear that? Present, present, and it's this time of the year. Uh-oh. It's that's presence right. time. Right. You're, you're, you're talking about a different kind of present. I know, no, no, because <laughs> I know, but the presence <laughs> of the Lord is a gift that he wants to give to us. That's right. It is a present. He yeah. wants us to invite him into Amen. his, he wants to be invited into, he wants his presence to be invited into our lives. Amen. And so what is, that is the best present, present that we can have. Well, and we're gearing up for this season of giving. A season of giving yeah. presents. Yeah, you know? Christmas is coming at us faster than a roller coaster. And, That's right. And we're excited about what God does at Christmas time because we can express our love for each other. Absolutely. And that's something. In, your, how you can express your love for me this year? Uh, <laughs> can I, I? No, this isn't really. Did you get my <laughs> list? Yes. Not yet. But you know something? I just want to encourage you that beyond the actual giving of the gifts or the presents, that I invite all of us to have a presence of the Lord Jesus Christ in us so that when we are around people that they would sense the presence of the Holy Spirit. And you know what that is? That's love. That's a fruit of the Spirit so that when we are, Dawn, you'll just sense the love that I have That's for you through the Lord. The no, I'll give you actual present. presence too. Well, I'm happy with that. No, but I'm, I'm just saying so many that. times you want to be a cheerful giver. You know, mm-hmm. you want to be just the hands and feet of Jesus. Let people see your, God's presence in you. Well, you're all wired up. You're all fired up. I'm ready for Let's Christmas. Just get the pulpit out. Get the pulpit out. <laughs> I wasn't meaning to preach. I was just the ready, excited ready. about Christmas. We're going to yeah. pass know? an offering plate in just a second and say, okay. amen, hallelujah. What would you like for us to sing as the altar call? Oh. Just as I am? Oh, no. I, I was, you know what? I've been singing that Christmas carol. Um, oh, what's that? What's that song about coming the, the mountain? What's the coming one around the mountain? No, no, no. <laughs> what? 
Go no, Town on the, on the Mountain. mountain. <laughs> yeah, that's the song I've Jesus been thinking Christ about. Jesus Christ is born. Well, I, I don't want to get yeah. out of our, our mm -hmm. introduction part here without saying this is the anniversary of the uh, attack on Pearl Harbor. Well, boy, you say celebrating that. Yeah, well, because we were attacked as a nation by Japan 76 years wow. ago today. Wow. So why do you say, why do we keep that date alive? Because so many men and women mm -hmm. gave their lives to fight for our freedoms. Mm -hmm. That's why. Because they, they stood up in that time when they had to, Pastor, and the nation rose up. Mm -hmm. And, you know, at that time, there's a, there's a parallel here. Because at that time, there was a divided nation. Part of the nation wanted to stay out of the war in Europe. And part of the nation said, because they had just fought in Europe. We had just fought in World War One, and the other part of the nation says, "No, we got to stand up against the evil that it, we're seeing coming out of Germany and out of Japan and out of Italy." But it was divided half and half. But then, when we were attacked, the nation came together, and everything was about winning that war. And so we're divided as a nation today, and un unlike there, we don't have an enemy like that we can put a flag on like Japan. We have an enemy that's spiritual, that manifests itself in natural ways like jihad with radical Islam and like progressivism which tries to change the minds of our children. That's an enemy mm -hmm. to us. We gotta recognize that, we gotta stand up. So that on the anniversary of Pearl Harbor, let's, and there's a story coming in just a minute, it's a life touching story. So let's, Let's get, go on to get ready for this, but to, to get started with the program, this is Thursday. Yep. Pastors yeah. are in the house. Let's get ready mm -hmm. for hard questions. Welcome to Hard Questions. This segment's where we have our pastors come together and take on the issues right out of the headlines. And we find the answers out of the Bible. On today's panel are... Dr. William R. Glaze, Bethany Baptist Church in Pittsburgh. The Pastor J. Anthony Gilbert Kingdom <laughs> Restoration <laughs> Christian <laughs> Center, Mount Washington, PA. I cannot beat that. I'm just simply Pete Jackaloni, <laughs> Rainbow Temple Assembly of God Church, McKeesport, PA. And I'm Jason Howard from Amplified Church in the eastern suburbs of Pittsburgh, the Strip District of Pittsburgh, and Indiana, PA. He's around there. <laughs> <laughs> he gets around. Where are you going, Jason? <laughs> he gets around, brother. Well, here's the question that was uh, called in to us. How do you help somebody, now hear this, that doesn't really want to be helped? Well, you know, I was, when I saw the question, uh, a scripture popped right into my mind. Mm. And it's uh, in Matthew chapter 23 and verse 37. And it, it says that Jesus, there were some people that even Jesus couldn't help. Mm -hmm. He said, uh, O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, oh. thou that killest the prophets and stoneth them who are sent unto thee. How often would I have gathered thy children together, even as a, a hen gathered her chickens, and you would not. So, I mean, Jesus wanted to help people, and they didn't want, they didn't want his help. And I think along with that, that brokenness of our Lord, I mean, this weeping over people that, and I think sometimes total transparency. In other words, being able to go to him and say, look, brother, I really do love you, and I really do care. You're not allowing me. You're, you're keeping me at, I, I mean, if you approach somebody like that, you're not allowing me to, I'm a pastor and I really want to help you. Um, and just because how do you fight that? I mean, it's the same thing with David uh, Wilkerson and Nikki Cruz. Nikki Cruz was out to cut him. And David Wilkerson said, you know what, Nikki, you can cut me to a thousand pieces, but every piece would cry out. Jesus loves you. So you talk, Pastor, you talk about when you're observing somebody's life yeah, and you yeah. see that they're doing something that may be questionable yeah. and then how you approach them? I think your approach is, is, I think if you go with, the old saying was, if you go with your cap in hand, if you humble yourself, I think you can have greater hmm. success, I hate to use the word success, greater achievements. Let's go to the left side of the table. Well, I think here. there's something about yielding um, as well to those people. It's in, can, how do you help someone that doesn't want that's to be it, helped? That's it, that's There's a yielding that happens. Um, I think about how the Bible says for women to submit to their husbands right. and to honor them. And what they're pretty much saying is to yield, right. yield to them. If your husband's a knucklehead, the best thing you can do is some, you need to tell them, but if they're not willing to be helped, yield to them. And it gives the Holy Spirit the right. opportunity to begin to work. If you just put your hands on them, oh, try to make them move, the Holy Spirit isn't gonna move in that. No. But you pray for them. And then the last thing is compassion. There you go. Um, understanding that this person is on the highway to destruction. Yeah. So not get angry, but to love them because they're gonna need someone to clean up the wreckage. 
Well, I think, you know, like you can't make people's decisions for them, right? No. Like you can't make someone be a certain way or do a certain thing. And I think sometimes we exhaust ourselves or maybe even burn ourselves out because we're trying to change people who don't want to be changed. And we're trying to get someone to do something that they're not going to do. Like you can't control another person. I think, though, that sometimes it's really easy to throw stones. I think it's sometimes it's really easy to be disillusioned, especially like I'm thinking about family members. It's like you wish that they were a certain way and they're not. And like it's Christmas time. We're all going to experience yeah. that. Yeah. Yeah. And sometimes I think it's like, man, I wish, like, I just want to, you know, shake them and tell them to live their life differently. <laughs> but sometimes your, um, like, aggressiveness yeah. about their behavior or their lifestyle actually builds a barrier between you yes, and them. Sure. And I just say, you can't underestimate the power of unconditional love, grace, and acceptance. I mean, Jesus loved and accepted and had grace for people who were doing some really stupid things, but yet he just loved them. Yeah, right. And you don't even necessarily hear him in, in the scriptures, you know, saying, this is terrible, this is terrible, this is terrible. He just loved them. Mm -hmm. And eventually you saw their lives change because the whole point of the gospel, the whole point of what we believe about Jesus is that unconditional grace and unconditional love and acceptance is truly what leads to transformation. Well, and, and if I could say this, even going back to the passage, mm -hmm. where these people didn't want Jesus' no. help. Jesus wanted to gather them. Yeah. But what did he do? He went to the cross. He died. And he died for them. He died and for then them. as we go and read in the book of Acts, you know, we see that uh, Peter was preaching and he said, the same Jesus whom you crucified. Right. And many of those same people came to the Lord. Right. Yeah. How, how important Grace. is in intercessory prayer mm -hmm. for somebody who has kind of turned you off or stayed code to you. You know, they don't want your help, but can you, through intercessory prayer, penetrate that life and see a change? I, I don't know so much, and I'm not trying to correct you, Don, nope. I, I, and uh, no, because of my respect. I, I don't know if it's so much us correcting them, but I think there's something done in the heavenlies. I think there's something done in the spiritual realm. So, pray, you know, we're told, pray without ceasing. I, I know I, if I can use my own father, for example, I mean, he completely disowned me when I got saved. And here's the guy, the only guy that I ever wanted approval from. Mm -hmm. And I wrestled with that for years. And I remember many nights, many, many nights, weeping the entire night for him. But then years later, God gave me the joy of leading my father to the Lord. But you never quit praying for him. Never. Well, you know, never I, quit. I think what, and it was years. And, it was, and what prayer does is that it works in the person's life. It works in their circumstances. So as we pray for them, you know, I mean, yeah, we can, if, if we can build barriers by trying to punch the gospel into them or yeah. trying to punch them into doing the right thing. But as we pray for them, then God begins to move in their circumstances. And God, you know, because, you know, sometimes if their heart is so hard, you know, that God, you know, might not be able to penetrate that heart. Mm -hmm. But God will work in their circumstances and begin to soften their heart so that they will be receptive to what he's trying to do. We also have to remember that we're not in a natural battle. 2 Corinthians 4, 4, I believe it is, says that the God of this world has blinded. That's right. right. So a lot of times right. you're not battling Johnny or Willie or right. Susie. Yeah. You're battling against the right. enemy over their souls That's and right. prayer disarms the That's enemy. Exactly so then the, the gospel will do its job, but we have to get the enemy out of the way, which we do that by spiritual warfare and prayer That's that right. the light of the gospel can go in and touch those hearts and illuminate them to the glorious gospel of Jesus Christ. I don't Christ. think you ever stop praying for someone. Don't ever stop believing for people. I, I don't believe that we should ever give up on anybody, yeah. but I think that um, you've got to just keep loving people. Yeah, just keep right. loving them, believing in them, yeah. championing them, standing with them. Yeah. And the more judgmental you are, I think the worse oh, it's going to be. Right but just now. love people. And I think yeah. that's the answer. Yeah. Yeah. The, so the, you can accept them without condoning what they're doing. Well, right, of course. And I think that's what Jesus did. Yeah. He died on the cross before we ever turned our hearts yeah, toward right. him. That's right. right. He accepted us before we changed anything yeah. about ourselves. And anyway, that's right. that's you right. know, right. Jesus is the one that changes us anyway, right? Yeah. So uh, I think that unconditional love and grace is the answer. I was reading a story about George Mueller, who ran the orphan <laughs> in, in England. Isn't he amazing? Yeah, and when he got saved, he started praying for four of his friends. And uh, during his lifetime, three of them came to the Lord. And uh, after he died, the other one came to the Lord. But during that time that George Mueller, he never stopped praying for him. Mm. And so that just goes to show you the power of prayer against the hard heart that, you know, God is able to do great things. Pray without and I, ceasing. And I believe prophets are over their life too. Um, I shared this story before, but real yeah. quickly, my dad, when I was out running, acting crazy, he never beat me up over it. He already had planted the seeds in me. He just came to me one day and said, why are you living like that? And I told him, I'm just having fun. He just said this to me, one day, you're not gonna be able to live like that anymore. And right in the middle of a club, the Holy Ghost came down and arrested my heart, convicted I love that me, story, and touched me in a supernatural yeah. way. So just prophesy one word yeah. over their life and let God do the rest. And Put I think, the seed in it. And I think along with that, it, you speak to people's potential. Speak Amen. encouragement right. into people, even when they are disappointing you, speak encouragement to them anyway. And I think that can birth something inside of them. Because Amen. the easiest thing to do is, is to come in 
condemning. And, right, exactly. And, and then you're really nullifying yourself. Right, yeah, yeah you cut yeah. the relationship I think off. I think that's positive, yeah. Well, you guys, great answers. Great answers because we all have people in our lives and people yeah. around us that just don't want to, they don't want to be helped. No. They're happy what they're doing. You know, yeah. they're still, the Bible says there's pleasure in sin for a season. season. Yeah. So they're in that fun season. And, but the end of that scripture says, but in the end is death and destruction. Oh, there will be that time when they're going to have to be bailed out. There's going to be that time when they're going to be needed. So they're going to come for help. They're going to come mm -hmm. looking for somebody. When the, when the, when the fun ends and the, see, and the suffering begins, yeah. they're going to oh, come my. looking for somebody that has been in their life that they can trust. Yeah. Be that person that's in their life. And until that happens, pray. Just pray. Just pray and ask Amen. the Lord to penetrate the darkness with light. Open up their eyes to see God's truth and let the Holy Spirit, pray that God will send people across this path with words for them. And that's, that's how you can influence people who are cold to the gospel and cold to you. Pick four people today, mm. four people today that's like that in your life, write them down on a note card, pray for them yes. every day. And they even celebrities, I'd say pick a celebrity that the Lord yeah. has put on your heart. Yeah. Somebody's out there on the edge doing crazy stuff. Put them on your prayer sheet and let God penetrate them. And then let's see what happens. Let, let God be God. We love your questions. Send them in to us. Send them to us at uh, hardquestions at ctvn.org or call the number on the screen. And the pastors will take them on. Thank you, pastors. I was diagnosed with boring mail. I just hated getting my mail because all I got were bills. I felt so bored and disconnected. One day, I called for the Cornerstone Real Life Newsletter. Now, I can't wait to go to my mailbox. Side effects of the Real Life Newsletter may include a closer walk with God, daily encouragement, information about Cornerstone Network special guests, and more. Call today for the Real Life Newsletter. It'll change your life. On December 7, 1941, 76 years ago today, the Japanese attacked the U.S. naval base in Pearl Harbor, which started the U.S. involvement in World War II. Earlier, Don had the opportunity to talk with T. Martin Bennett about the book Wounded Tiger. His book tells us the remarkable story of how the Japanese pilot who led the attack met Jesus. Let's join them as they talk about Pearl Harbor. Pearl Harbor was a surprise. How could it... How could it have been a surprise? Well, America was very confident that uh, the Japanese could not get to them. They did not respect the Japanese as a nation. And uh, they, they were just overconfident in their own strength. And I think that happens to us as individuals as well. So they were just, were we were just asleep at the wheel. I mean, they knew that there was a conflict brewing. Europe was, in, it was, was boiling over with war. And we, just, we, we were just kind of set on the sidelines. Well, the Japanese, it took a long shot. They, the Japanese didn't think that they could really carry this off uh, scot-free. They thought it would be very difficult to actually get all the way to Pearl Harbor. So they came in through the north, uh, and generally the north seas of the Pacific are, are stormy seas, and they were when the Japanese Imperial Navy came out. Uh, but the Americans were only looking west and south. They weren't looking north. They had no scout planes going north because it would be too long of a trip. Uh, the Japanese actually had to refuel on the ocean. It was the first time that had been done for a major operation like that. So they just had no expectation. And that's how they got through. But the Japanese goal was really to preemptively prevent the United States from counterattacking after they swept through Southeast Asia and Malaysia and Indonesia because they wanted the oil. Now, the, the Japanese had no, uh, they knew that they could not win a war against the United States and China simultaneously. Right. right. So they knew they could never beat the Americans in a war. So as a younger man, when I'm in grade school, high school, I'm thinking, what are the Japanese thinking? They're going right. to take over the United right, States? Right, right. It doesn't make any sense to me. So the Japanese saw what happened in Europe. They admired 
Hitler, and of course they were part of the Axis powers, and they thought, well, look at this. Uh, Hitler sweeps through Europe, and what does the United States do? They right. say, we're isolationists, not our problem. They already saw World War I, millions of people die for nothing, in Americans' view, and they thought, we don't want to get involved in some European war. So the Japanese thought, well, gee whiz. If the Americans are not going to go help their allies, they don't help England, they, could, they didn't send troops, America was saying it's not our problem, if we sweep through Southeast Asia, they're going to leave us alone too. That's what they believed. But they thought, you know what, they might counterattack, so we will go ahead and just get rid of their navy, and then we're scot-free. And we'd think they felt they would be able to negotiate terms favorable to Japan. Now, when they came, this was not a minor move. They brought the entire fleet. Right, so it was not just Pearl Harbor. A lot of people think, including myself, well, it's the Pearl Harbor attack. No, that's actually not the focus of what happened. They were attacking all of Southeast Asia and islands and everything all simultaneously, mm -hmm. and they wanted to prevent America from a preemptive, excuse me, a retaliatory strike back. So it was a big, big, big operation. Pearl Harbor was only a part of it, and it wasn't even the major part of it. Well, as you could tell, T. Martin Bennett is a historian, he doesn't call himself an historian, but he is a historian, <laughs> he's a writer, and he's authored a, a, a new book called Wounded Tiger, and, and we are talking about, uh, and we're going to talk a little bit about the book as it's in, set in this time period. Your, 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 your main character was the lead pilot on right, this attack. Right, so Mitsuo Fuchida was the man who led the attack on Pearl Harbor. He was uh, handpicked by Admiral Yamamoto, and uh, not only did he lead the attack, but his life was changed by an American prisoner of war who was actually part of the Doolittle Raid, and he was, his life was changed by an American girl who he never met. So his life story is actually quite interesting, uh, and it's, it's a transformation story that uh, I've never seen anything like it in my life, and it's, it's, it's gotten tremendous reviews, so uh, it's, it's a fascinating story. What, what kind of mentality did he have as a young man uh, to become the lead pilot? This is quite the honor. Well, like many other young Japanese men in his day and age, in the 1920s, he, wanted, he aspired to be in the military. His father wanted to be in the military, but he couldn't because he, had, he, had a, he was blind in one eye from hitting, being hit in the face with a baseball. Mm. So um, Fujita wanted to be in the military. He wanted to be in the Navy. And uh, he applied to what would have been the equivalent of the Annapolis Naval Academy, only it was called the Edajima School in, in Edajima, Japan, which is near Hiroshima. So he applied, but he was rejected. He wasn't big and strong, and he had to go back and work, and he worked really hard to get into this elite academy. Once he got in there, planes were brand new, and he, he took a ride on a seaplane. Once he was up in the air, he thought, wow, I want to be in this great plane. At the same time, uh, Japan was in the tail end of their industrial revolution. They had ramped up to be equivalent to the West in many ways, and they wanted to be recognized as a great nation, but they weren't quite there yet, and what all great nations do is they conquer and they colonize. That's right. The, That's the British the colonized the, India, uh, you see all these colonies in Japan, and, and excuse me, in, uh, in uh, Africa, and sure. other places, and, and the Japanese saw the Germans expanding, they thought, we're going to expand too, we're going to find our place in the world, we're going to be a great nation, and Fuchida was that kind of person, I want to be a great nation. And their vision was to take over all Southeast Asia and through the Philippines and all. Right, and the, the phrase they used was Asia is for Asians. Let's get rid of the white colonists and let's just make it for us. That's the way they presented it to Asia. But of course, they wanted to be, they said, we'll be big brother, you'll be little brother. So what was, in, in the last minute we have in our time together, what happened to this pilot? When it, what, do you know in your research after they were successful how that impacted his life? Well, he became a superstar in Japan. Fuchida was the Michael Jackson of his day. He was in the front page of all the papers. This surprise attack was more successful than the Japanese ever imagined. He ended up meeting the emperor, was introduced to him one-on-one. -on -one. Wow. Wow. And you got to understand, in our day and age, we see the president, we hear his voice. In Japan, nobody saw his face, nobody heard his voice. He was a mystical semi-god, you know, a demigod. And he was introduced to him, and he met with him, and... Uh, from that point forward, he, he was just full of pride and what he calls victory sickness. But that's not where his life ended. No. And I'm not going to go any further than that. You need to get the book, Wounded Tiger, to find out the testimony, the God story, the supernatural story of how the Lord did something in this man's life that changed him and a lot of people forever. Thank you for writing it. 
Thanks for your talk to us about Pearl Harbor. Thanks so much. God Aaron. bless you as you go forward. Thanks very much. A top U.S. official is calling for Sudan to stop tearing down churches. Deputy Secretary of State John Sullivan demanded authorities to put an end to demolitions. During a speech at a university, Sullivan highlighted the plight of the Christian community. He condemned the Muslim nation's oppression against believers and said it's wrong for the Sudanese government to deny permits to build new churches. A Christian ministry released emergency funds for the Rohingya Muslims in Myanmar. As the humanitarian crisis continues there, World Relief provided help to the refugees. More than half a million Rohingyas have fled Myanmar due to targeted violence and persecution. World Relief says they're grateful for the Christians in Bangladesh and Pakistan who have had compassion towards them. The ministry says the Western Church needs to follow their lead and care about the condition of the Rohingya Muslims. Well, that's all for God in the Headlines. Have a great day on Purpose. You know, when I, I taped that interview a while ago. Okay. And it brought back memories because uh, I thought about this fella and how he was dedicated to write a story about a guy he'd never met. The author never met this uh, Japanese. He, the Japanese pilot had died. Okay. He died in, I think, the 70s. But he was fascinated with his life story because he went on to become a Christian. The pilot. That is totally amazing. But that's God, you know? Well, mm -hmm. when he became a Christian, he was then became outcast mm. in Japan. Because Japan, Japan it was not a Christian, still is not a Christian nation. Mm -hmm. And so who was the hero of uh, Pearl Harbor for Japan? That was the big victory mm -hmm. for in Japan. They celebrated Pearl Harbor. He was the hero of Pearl Harbor. He became... Uh, he came to know the Lord supernaturally, sovereignly, and he got cast out of Japan. He didn't get cast out of the nation. He got relegated from being in the limelight mm -hmm. to being put in this little farm out wow. in the outskirts of the city. He wasn't allowed. He wasn't allowed to participate in the culture anymore because of his faith in Jesus. So he became like a prisoner. Of, he was of a the prisoner, state? but he was a. They, they shunned him. Mm. Ostracized. They mm. put him aside. And it didn't affect his faith. And then the, the West started hearing that story. And then he became kind of a hero in the West. Even though he was the bombing pilot, the lead bombardier pilot wow. that flew into Pearl Harbor and caused such destruction mm -hmm. and such death, he then was welcomed to come to the United States and by the Christians in the United States really? and tell his testimony. Isn't, mm -hmm. that, isn't, that, isn't that a, a wild twist? It really is. From our twist. worst enemy to our brother in Christ. How God can take a life and do that. Well, that's what I think about, just the redeeming grace of Jesus Christ. You know, the Bible says in Romans 5, I believe it is, that while we were without strength, enemies, ungodly, and sinners, he died for us. Mm. So that, what a great illustration of that. And, you know, if you don't know Jesus that's Christ as your Savior today, why don't you pick up that phone right now and dial 888-665-4483, no matter what you've done, how far you've fallen, doesn't matter even if you uh, uh, criticized the church and talked right. about the preacher That's or even right. about Jesus. That's right. Jesus still loves you today. Pick up that phone and receive Jesus Christ as your Savior today. Amen. Well, maybe you were leading a bombing attack on Christians. That's maybe right. Maybe you've been a ridiculer mm -hmm. and made fun of Christians and Christian TV. Maybe you're watching this thing on by those. And you've been against the church and against God. God, God loves you. Mm -hmm. and as Pastor Jay said, he's, he's this close to you all the time. You don't have to, you don't have to run from him. He, you can run to him. That's right. Run, run to God. Run to him. He loves you, and especially this Christmas season. Mm -hmm. you know, that's why we, 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 we do this program, and that's why we do coaching. You know, coaching is to help us become who we are in Christ. We're going to go, when we come back, and into a coaching session. I'll see you there. There is really no greater joy in my life than to see my children and grandchildren safe and happy. When I was young, the world seemed slower and safer. You could turn on the television and not be embarrassed by what might come up on the screen. Then I found Cornerstone, a television network whose mission is to uplift and inspire. That safe place that holds Christian family values at the forefront of what it does. 
And that's why I love Cornerstone because I know I can leave the room and know that when my son is watching the kids programming, that the same values that my mom and dad placed in me are coming through the screen. Cornerstone is helping to make sure that the lasting legacy of faith and family values is instilled in our family and reinforced in our own lives with great teaching and preaching. They're here to support my family and yours 24 hours a day, seven days a week with prayer and programming that bring biblical principles to light. That's Cornerstone and that's the difference. At Real Life Coaching, our goal is to help you become the best you possible and then to win in life God's way. Not, not to have a settled for life, but to have a victorious, purposeful life. That's our goal for you in coaching. Do you know that the Lord has given us His Holy Spirit to help us to do this, to comfort us, to guide us, to empower us? Sarah Bowen is an author and a speaker, and she's here as our li real life coach. And in this session, she's gonna teach us how we can sidestep those spiritual landmines. You know, we're talking about how to walk in the Spirit. You've been teaching us all week long about what it means to be filled with the Spirit of God. Now, there are, we have an adversary. Right. And you write in your book about the adversary. You write about these landmines. Tell us about the landmines. Yeah, landmines are it's an interesting idea. And the first place I ever came in contact with landmines um, was in Angola. Mm. And uh, they told me, they said we were taking this long drive, like, 10, 12 hour drive into the you know rural area and they said, look, if you need to use the bathroom, you know, you gotta go in the bush. Okay, I get it. So but they said be careful because if the if there's a tree there and it has a red branch on it, that means that the field behind it has not been cleared of landmines. But if it's a white branch, then it's clear and you can, you know, hmm. go on your jolly way. <laughs> and I was like, what kind of country has, you know, like, because it's civil war and all that. But it was interesting because I thought landmines, I don't, this is not part of my normal day to day. I live in America. We don't have landmines. Mm -hmm. But yet I would say that sometimes for us with the Holy Spirit, there are landmines. And we don't, you don't know a landmine until oftentimes it's too late, right? You step on it, boom, and then you're just, you're dead from, from contact. But I want to say this. I think with the Holy Spirit, particularly in our church world, um, in, in our culture that we tend to not be aware of some of these landmines. And some of the landmines are some of our own internal thinking, you know, about who's the Holy Spirit. We don't even know sometimes who the Holy Spirit is. Or sometimes we think of the Holy Spirit as kind of this misty, ethereal, you know, esoteric, cloudy, foggy, you know, whatever, a ghost thing out there. Mm -hmm. And if that's the mindset, I would say that's a landmine because you're not really connecting, you're not really appreciating a personal connection and relationship with the Holy Spirit that you can have because the Holy Spirit's never intended to be mystical and just floaty and theoretical, but rather very much, you know, think about it, Don. The, in Genesis chapter one, verse two, it says the Spirit of God hovered over the face of the earth. Mm -hmm. And when you look at the context of that, it says the earth was formless and without, with the void and without structure, without substance. And when you think about the Holy Spirit, and what did the Holy Spirit do? Hovering, the idea in the Hebrew is the idea to give structure and order and, and to organize. And the next, very next things that happen in those first couple of days of, of creation is God separated stuff. So God separated uh, air from land and water. God separated land from water. So it was this separating and organizing and structuring. And the Holy Spirit was an integral part of that whole thing. So the Holy Spirit is never meant to be, and never designed to just be some kind of floating ethereal, woo, woo that's a landmine. Mm -hmm. if we think in those terms. Another landmine I'd say is some, sometimes uh, various denominations and mindsets about the Holy Spirit, you know, we, we acknowledge the Holy Spirit and that's it. <laughs> that's right. You know, I mean, there's, and it's not an overt hostility because we read the Bible verse, don't blaspheme. So there's no overt hostility, but there's this sense of, 
you know, those are the weirdos that do the Holy Spirit. So don't get too close to that. That's just too over the top. Family, I would say that's a landmine. Mm -hmm. If we don't know who the Holy Spirit is, if we're not open to the Holy Spirit, then we just think Holy Spirit's kind of for the freaks and the weirdos and kind of the psycho wacky people, um, then I would say that's a landmine. Um, and I've seen and I've met and had conversations with individuals who have stepped on that landmine. And uh, they're nice to me and they're polite, but they think I'm kind of a, a crazy person. And I think that's, I think that's a, a tragedy, honestly, because I don't think the Holy Spirit ever intended um, to be disconnected or to kind of have this remote acknowledgement. Oh yeah. yeah, the Holy Spirit's intended to be a part of our daily living. So I think that's a landmine when we think, oh, you know, kind of distant and making it freaky and all that. I think these are common landmines. Mm -hmm. um, and I think another landmine is this idea that we have to understand everything um, so that we can do it. Um, and I don't think that's a healthy mindset either because if we're going to walk with the Holy Spirit, mm -hmm. the Holy Spirit will ask us to do things we don't always understand. Um, and the Holy Spirit of love goes beyond our natural thinking. So there are times when the Holy Spirit will say, look, sir, I want you to do this. And I'll be like, eh, you know, and I'll have that internal argument. I don't want to do that. I'll be weird. I'll be a freak. I feel awkward. They're not going to learn it and all this. And I still feel like this internal <laughs> conflict. The Holy Spirit's just, come on, let's go. So I, I fall into following the Holy Spirit and letting the Holy Spirit lead me. Um, but the landmine inside would be, mm, man, I'm not going to do that because I'm going to feel like a freak or a weirdo. So these are things that I think are, are common landmines that we have uh, individually, but also even collectively, because not everybody in the body of Christ thinks the Holy Spirit's awesome. <laughs> well, just because they've never really had an engagement with him, never really had a fellowship with him. Right. And I didn't grow up in a, in a world that knew about the Holy Spirit. Yeah. I didn't. That wasn't my upbringing, but when I had an engagement with him, an encounter with him, it was, it was unexplainable. So, and I'm a logical guy, you know, I'm the sure. guy who wants to put it all in test tubes and test it and yeah. prove it and make it scientific. Yeah. We well, can't do that with God. You can't put the Holy Spirit in a test tube. No. You can't replicate his actions. He never even replicates his actions. Sure. That's another one of those landmines. We always do it this way. God always does it this way. Mm -hmm. He never always does anything mm -hmm. anyway. <laughs> you know, he's God. Yeah. The whole definition of him is he wants to do what he wants to do. Mm -hmm. So why do we get in that? And I, I understand that having, does it come from a root of wanting to be in control? Mm -hmm. Not get on the edge? I think so, and I think it's a root sometimes of control. It's a root of fear, fear of the unknown. I'm gonna, you know, like what, am I gonna do something creepy or weird or off the deep end mm -hmm. or, you know, I think there's a lot of things. I think it's the idea of understanding and, you know, enlightenment thinking says, Descartes, I think therefore I am. And that's it, that's the reality. And I wanna encourage you that, that these are landmines. You know, if we have to limit, if we say, well, the Holy Spirit's limited to what I think and what I understand, that's a landmine. And I would say maybe, maybe you've done that. And maybe it's time to kind of take off that limit, take mm -hmm. off that boundary. Mm -hmm. um, maybe, maybe there's a control thing for you where you're like, I need to be in control. Sometimes that comes from bad experiences in our childhood where we just, some bad things happen to us. And so we, we just don't ever let go of control. And the Holy Spirit is saying, I want to heal you mm -hmm. of some of those memories, of some of those experiences. Let me come inside and let me talk to you and walk with you and heal you on the inside from that stuff so you're not living such a constricted, tight, little controlled life, mm. so limited. The Holy Spirit wants to do lots of things to help us, but sometimes we have to say, okay, these are landmines that I have in my thinking um, and, and really saying, no, I'm not going to live according to those landmines anymore. I'm not going to be controlled by that stuff. Well, even when we've been filled with the Spirit and we look to the next level of what God's called us to do, we can put those landmines back in place. Right. Well, I can go this far, but no farther. Right. You know, I'm okay with prophecy, but let's stay away from tongues. Right. You know, whatever, whatever <laughs> that is, because I still have to keep yep. my hands on the steering wheel yep. when God wants us to get into one of those new um, self-driving cars of the spirit and right. say, Take me, Lord, where you want me to go. Yep. Take the wheel, Jesus. <laughs> yeah, take, <laughs> I like it. I like take it. I like the it. Wheel, Jesus. But you know, um, Paul talks about a couple of different landmines, and 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 the first one I would say is in Acts seven. It's not Paul; it's Luke who wrote Acts. But um, at the end of chapter seven, the Pharisees and Sadducees, religious leaders, are stoning. They're going to stone Stephen, 
And Stephen says something really interesting. He says, you always resist the Holy Spirit. And I remember every time I read that, it just is like a gut punch because these are religious leaders who think they're on the right path, who think they're well-intentioned. And Stephen says, you always resist. And I think as religious leaders, as people who are people of faith, we need to be conscientious that we are not resisting the Holy Spirit. And 1 Thessalonians says the same thing as far as don't quench the Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm. It relates to the gifts of the Holy Spirit, prophecy and all that. In Ephesians, it says don't grieve the Holy Spirit. Grieving the Holy Spirit happens. You look at the context when there's dissension, backbiting, uh, division in the body of Christ that grieves the Holy Spirit. And of course, the last landmine, the biggest one is blaspheme. Mm -hmm. Don't blaspheme the Holy Spirit. Jesus says that's the unpardonable sin. When you've calloused your heart so hard that there's no response, there's, it's a deadening to the heart of the, of the touch of the Holy Spirit. These are landmines that are biblical landmines that I think we really need to be aware of, alert to, so we don't fall prey to that stuff. Well, how important is the Holy Spirit to you? Mm. In your daily walk, I know you wrote a book, but in your daily walk, how important is he? So my friend asked me that this week. And uh, I said to her, I said, you know, you think about um, particle board. And particle board is a combination of glue and, uh, and wood chips, right? Or, or sawdust or whatever. And the thing that only gives it any kind of cohesion is the glue. That's Holy Spirit for me. <laughs> Keeps hold me. I'm like, otherwise I just am like a pile of sawdust. I'm just... <laughs> waiting for some like little match to torch me and kind of blow away in the wind because I can't keep it together without the Holy Spirit. How do you keep filled? Hmm. I mean, because you, you leak. You told us before, you leak. That filling, um, my morning prayer time, mm -hmm. I take some good quality time, but then throughout the day, I like to have some like internal check-ins, mm -hmm. you know, struggling here, Ooh, don't understand how to do that. Ugh, you know, or those moments where I'm in Walmart and I'm getting groceries and I feel the Holy Spirit say, mm, get that person verse. Ooh, really? <laughs> you know, but those, those, this, and the intentionality. And I really want and I crave and I ask the Holy Spirit, increase my awareness. Help me to be more sensitive to you. I want to recognize, I want to flow. And I don't want it just for, for the public consumption. Right. I want it just in my daily regular everyday life. Because even if you weren't Sarah, the speaker, writer, yeah. minister, you have to have the Holy oh, Spirit. Oh, man. Well, would you, would you lead us in prayer about being refilled yeah. with the Holy Spirit? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'd love to pray for you. Let's just take a moment and maybe put your palms up just kind of in receiving mode and let's just pray. Holy Spirit, I know that you're here with us, with each viewer, each person watching right now and here in the studio with us. So I pray that you would come in a fresh way, in a fresh infusion of your presence to each viewer. We're conduits, we're to be your temple. So please come and dwell in us, fill us again and afresh and anew yes. and help us be the glue to hold us together and carry us and make us effective and conduits for you. Thank you, Holy Spirit, for who you are to us individually and also through us. We yield and surrender and enjoy our fellowship and walk with you more and more every day in Jesus' name, amen. Amen, amen, amen. Sarah, it's good to have you here with us. Love it, love it. You know, it, I appreciate it, you personally and the gift that's in you. Yeah. And that's a gift from the yeah, Holy Spirit. Totally, totally. The more we go down this path of Christian, walk into mm -hmm. Christian life, the, the life that Jesus paved for us, the more I realize that without the Spirit of God, I'm just done, Yeah, you know. You can get to a certain place where you set your willpower and you can kind of struggle your way through a discipline. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm not gonna drink, I'm not gonna cuss, I'm not gonna, you know, and make that thing happen and live mm -hmm. a very strict, almost pharisaical type of a life. Right. But to get abundant life, right. the life that Jesus promised, right. we have no other option. Sure. We have to be filled with the Spirit. Yep. Yep. What's beautiful is that God has provided everything we need for it, everything we need. And part of what we need is to be taught, to be encouraged, to be edified by the Spirit. Edified is just a fancy word. It means to be built up because sometimes you get knocked down. 
You need to be built up. So Sarah wrote a book called In Step with the Spirit. And I just want to highly recommend for you to get a copy. And normally I'd say go to our website, but in this case, I don't have to say that. I can say she's made it available to us, our Cornerstone family. And we're going to make this available to you and a DVD that she's recorded just for us. It's in the same topic of how to walk in the power of the Spirit of God, how to identify Him, how to avoid those landmines, how to have a supernatural family, how to be filled and continually be, be filled how to keep going towards the destiny that God's created you to have. With your gift of the ministry of $30, we're going to send it to you, both of them to you, and we're going to pay for the shipping. We're going to get them to you as soon as we possibly can. And I pray that they will come to you and you will put them in your life, in your family's lives, in your kids' lives, in your grandkids' life, and you'll watch God move. See, that's all he's really wanting for us to do is for us to trust him and to to watch him work in our lives. And he can't work as long as we're doing the job. So let's, let's surrender. Sarah, thank you for coming. Yeah, super great. God bless great. you. Love it. And Love the it. ministry that God has given you and moved into, come, we talk about that a lot. She'll be back with us. I know she will be back with us. And I'm, I'm thankful for you too. And I'm thankful for the Holy Spirit. You know that he is not only a theory, but he is the energy of God, the power of God in your and my life. When you get this book and this DVD, it'll help empower you and energize you in a supernatural way, in a supernatural way. And when things happen in your life supernaturally, then you want to tell your testimony. You want to share it with others. And when you share it with others, God blesses you and them. Here's a story of God's blessing. Isolation, detachment, seclusion, these are all words to describe the emptiness and pain that I have been feeling inside. After 50 years of marriage, my husband and I have been separated for four years. I still love my husband very much, and I've tried everything I could think of to save our marriage. I prayed each and every day that God would bring my husband back into my life. I decided to call the Cornerstone Prayer Line and I spoke with a prayer partner. She told me to be strong and to put my complete trust in the Lord. A few days later, my husband called me one night and we talked for hours. We reconciled our differences and now we are back together. Thank you, God, for restoring my marriage. Your grace and your faithfulness never ceases to amaze me. Mm, mm, mm. Thank you, Jesus. I love the, that lady at the end of her testimony, you know, some, she, uh, maybe you didn't hear at home, maybe you, you didn't hear, but she went like, it's like when you get good food, you know? Mm, mm, Life mm. is good. Remember, that's the Campbell's thing. Mm, mm, good. Oh, mm, mm, oh good. yeah. Mm, mm, good. God is better than Campbell's. Mm, God is Amen. Than Campbell's. Is. <laughs> well, Sarah did a phenomenal job teaching us about yes. the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit is a subject that is, he's very misunderstood. Maybe you don't have a clear understanding of who he is and what his role is, and he sounds spooky and kind of, kind of misty, and we call him the Holy Ghost, and we mm-hmm. think about him in ways that aren't really tangible. I hope that through the coaching process uh, with Sarah, it's a little clearer now that the Holy Spirit is the third person in the Trinity, yes. Pastor. Yeah. He's equal to God, and Jesus e- equals the wrong word, but they're three in one. Right. Mm-hmm. And we don't really focus much on who he is and what he does, even though he do, everything that impacts our lives is because of the Holy Spirit. Mm-hmm. You're right. And, uh, you know, I think a lot of people get weirded out. You know, I remember a guy telling a story one time about uh, he was a young boy in a church and the person was on the ground and they're shaking and they're like frothing in the mouth. And they yeah. said, he's getting purged. He's getting purged. And he said, Lord, don't purge me <laughs> because he didn't want to be purged, you know, sure. because we see a lot of manifestations. Yeah. 
But that doesn't mean that's who he is. A lot of people get caught up in emotionalism and things like that, but he's right. so vital to our spiritual walk. I love in the interview where she talked about how he's the glue yes. that holds us together. And it's funny you asked her, well, who's the Holy Spirit to you? And she just stopped and closed her eyes. And you can tell someone that has a relationship with the Holy Spirit because there's something that he gives them and the relationship mm -hmm. they have that just holds everything together. And it just took me into a place of prayer, just spiritually speaking, when I saw her doing that because how mm -hmm. important he was to her. And he is important, but so it's, important. it is, I liked how she talked about landmines. We were talking about it first, like landmines, but the name of her book is In Step with the Holy Spirit. Yeah. So, uh, you know, we were like, oh, yes. And then just things that she mentioned, I thought were really critical. Like first thing is in our mindset about, you were mentioning about how we perceive the Holy Spirit. He's vital in our lives. And, and that um, we do sometimes think, other people that talk about the Holy Spirit, they're sort of freaky. Don't you think so? Sometimes some people see that. I mean, it's hard. Right. It really is mm -hmm. hard to, well, we should never judge anybody. Let's, let's, yeah. let's be honest with each other. Right. We should never judge anybody by what we see. Mm -hmm. So sometimes there are strange idiosyncrasies about people that we go, ooh, mm -hmm. and we kind of look at them and, and there are people on TV that I kind of go, ooh. Mm -hmm. And I'll mention one of them, Ernest Angley. He, I kind of watch Ernest, Brother Ernest Angley from Akron, Ohio. And I go, he's strange. But you know what? The Lord has used him in mighty, mighty ways. Absolutely. I'm going, why, why, who are you, Don? Just <laughs> hush up. That's right. Stop, <laughs> your, stop your thinking because that means nothing. I mean, and sometimes I'm, I'm wondering if it doesn't take a bit of an odd person to just get surrendered to God, period. Right. Because yeah. what do you got to do? You got to take your head off, kind of. You got to yeah. take your reasoning power and put it aside. Mm -hmm. And that's why I think why the Holy Spirit is so unusually disconnected to us because we can't understand right. with our minds. Especially if you start talking, now love, oh, love, you know, mm -hmm. we can get that. But when you start talking about things like uh, healing, supernatural signs and wonders, yeah. you know, the, mirac the miracle mm -hmm. gifts, those kinds of things make a lot of us nervous. Yeah. Because what is that? Right. Yeah. You know, mm -hmm. what is that? So Pastor, when you if you came up to somebody that didn't know anything about God and you said God wants to heal you, how would you explain the Holy Spirit and his healing power? Well, what I always believe is that the Holy Spirit is to us what Jesus was to the disciples. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Because Jesus was limited in his physical body. He said, it's expedient that I go away. So he gave us the Holy Spirit. So I'd say, if you would like God to heal you, that's what the Holy Spirit is here for now, mm. is because Jesus can't move in the physical body and that's why he gave us the Spirit. And he actually said to his disciples, it's better yeah. for you mm -hmm. that I go. Jesus said that to his disciples. I know that that had to really make him think, how could it be better right. that I go? He said, because I'm going to send you the helper, the helper, mm -hmm. the helper. Amen. And that's what Sarah's works all about, how to be in step <clears throat> with the Holy Spirit, mm -hmm. how to be in harmony. As I said in the coaching, in one of our sessions, I kind of envision a dance partner. You know, you ever watch those, whether I, I don't really like dancing with the stars, it's gotten kind of weird, but, well, ball or dancing <laughs> but, or but it like used to be where they, they, you know, they just flow together, mm -hmm. you know, partners flowing together. Can envision that with the Holy Spirit that as I move, He moves; as He moves, I move, and it's it's in sequence and, and orchestrated to His purposes. That's what this book is all about. How do you do that? How do you walk in that? And how do you how do you avoid those landmines that are put by the devil out there on your path to 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 kill, to steal, and destroy destroy you? And we're going to put the book into your hands along with. A DVD that Sarah created for us. On this DVD is really special, by the way. The book is phenomenal. You can get that on, on Amazon probably. But you, the, the DVD and the book only together here at Cornerstone for our family. Mm -hmm. But on this DVD, and the reason I like this is because there's over an hour worth of teaching on the DVD, and you kind of see inside. But teachings like the spirit, what is a spirit filled life? What does it mm -hmm. mean to be led by the spirit? What's a supernatural family? How do you make your family supernatural in the spirit? Boy, that's, 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 that's good news. That is good. Mm -hmm. You know, how to defy the impossible challenges and circumstances that you face. Mm -hmm. How do you defy those impossible things? And then finally, uh, this landmine teaching, 
What do you do with the landmines that are out there? Where, do you, where are they? And how not to step on them? Because, you know, if you step on them, it's going to damage you. Well, there are things that we don't see that real life coaching illuminates to you. So you don't have to, because landmines usually are underground. Yeah, they're, yeah, they're they, you can't see them. But what we're doing is kind of putting a little metal detector out there with you by a thing called real life coaching so they can see those landmines. And what I like about she mentioned about landmines is that they're misconceptions about the Holy Spirit. Mm. There are beliefs about him that stop us from flowing in the supernatural. That's right. And that's mm -hmm. important because yeah, yeah. our faith, if it's not lined up with the word, we can limit what God wants to do. Wow. Well, if mm -hmm. your heart's desire is to be more than just a natural person, to live a regular life and kind of just kind of make it, that, that's not a good desire, by the way. That, that desire is going to leave you frustrated because you can't be a Christian to be regular. You can't be a Christian and be part of this world. I mean, it, it just doesn't fit. You're an alien to this world. So you've got to be supernatural to live your Christian life. If you want to live that kind of life, you cannot, let me emphasize it really, Terry, you cannot be successful as a Christian in, in this world without the presence of the Holy Spirit in your life. Well, you know, and I want to add to that, that there's no age qualification for this. Mm -hmm. You know, you can be 94 years old and you might be saying, uh, I lived my life as a natural kind of life, but I want, you can be 94 and say, Holy Spirit, I want to be led by you. And your last years can be making a phenomenal impact. So it's no age requirement for Holy Spirit that, living. That reminds me, Terry's so right, that reminds me of the, of the man who came up to us at, uh, at Sam's Club the other day. Oh yes. Hi, Mr. Ben. Mr. Yes. Bench mm -hmm. came up. He's he's interesting, very, very he's fit. He's active guy. He has on a Indiana Jones hat, <laughs> yeah, complete with the the thing oh, that okay. goes around your neck, you know. And I looked at him, and and, I, and he was talking to Terry, and he recognized Terry, and he said, "I watch you every day, every day on TV. I watch you every day." He said, I said, "How old are you?" He said, I'm 91 years old. That's right. wow. He said, I am better today than I've ever been before in my life. I'm full of God and raring to go. <laughs> right. I went, man, how do I get what you got? That's I want right. what you got. He's 91 years old. And he's, he's ready. Anyway, I got more of that story. Stay tuned to real life. I'm going to tell you that story. In fact, We'll get him up here. I asked We've him if he'd come. We've invited him to come on up. He'd bless, he'd, what a he's going to bless the socks off you when you see Mr. Bench. We, we, uh, we, we love you. I know we're running out of time here, but we love you, and we do this program just especially for you. I'm so glad you tuned in. We, we believe in the power of prayer. We believe in the power of the Holy Spirit. We believe in the power of confession that God is greater. The great mm -hmm. one lives inside of us, Pastor Jay. And mm -hmm. would you just... Usher out a prayer over all of these people who've called in and send out a prayer blessing over them as we close this program. Amen. Amen. Well, Amen. just right now, right in your home, just receive now just a fresh wind of the Holy Spirit into your life. Just receive that fresh baptism. And Father, we thank you for the anointing of the Holy Ghost that's going out across the airwaves yes. right now, Father God, that's going into homes, that's going into hospital rooms, that's going yes. into jail cells, wherever they are. And Father, we just pray that we might open ourselves up to be led by the power yes, of God. the Holy Ghost in our lives. That Lord, not only will we be blessed, but Lord, we would go out and be a blessing wherever it is that we go. Let out of our belly flow rivers of living water. And Father, I thank you for ministering to every marriage, to every mind. We pray that the spirit of freedom would come upon every life that is addicted today. Any stronghold from Cornerstone Television wishes to thank all our faithful viewers whose consistent prayers and financial support have made this program possible. 